Is it okay for our 4-H club to go downhill skiing? Do we need to take out extra insurance for that? Can our youth participate in a local parade? Can we plan a camping trip for our 4-H members? How do we go about planning a petting zoo? Can our horse club have a fundraiser at the county fair and give rides on our horses? Have you ever asked any of these questions or questions similar to this and not know what the answer is? Well, look no further. The answers to these questions have always been available, but now they're located on the Minnesota 4-H website for volunteers to access directly. Not only will you be able to answer these questions, but you will be given the information and tools to manage all areas of risk in the programs you organize. Welcome to the Risk Management Training for Volunteers. I think we can all agree that keeping youth safe is important because you as volunteers work with young people in the 4-H program, readying you to manage risk is essential. Today's training is designed to prepare and ready you for working within risk management policies and practices. Many of these policies and practices have existed for quite a while, but like I said, now they're available to you, the volunteer. At the end of this training, it is our goal that you'll be able to do the following, that you will understand risk management when we look at it in our 4-H Youth Development Program, that you can use the tools to plan for risk management, and that you understand your responsibilities in managing risk. To accomplish this, we're going to talk about the importance of this work, check out some of the tools that are available to help volunteers plan for risk, and practice using the tools while working through a scenario. Preparing for risk is not just a roll of the dice, where we hope we're lucky and nothing happens and no one gets hurt. No, as Extension employees and adult volunteers, it is our responsibility to make it happen, ensuring youth are safe while participating in 4-H programs. Let's face it, accidents do happen, people do get hurt, and some things are out of our control. But we want to make sure that we do our best to prevent risk and the things we can control. Knowledge is power, and when you know how to manage risk and you plan your programs with this mindset, the outcomes will be better for everyone involved. So what is risk? Risk is exposure to danger, harm, and loss. Youth development research by Gisela Kanapka and Karen Pittman identified critical elements essential to the healthy development of young people. One of these elements is that young people will learn better and participate more fully when they feel physically and emotionally safe. The Minnesota 4-H Youth Development Program is committed to providing safe and healthy environments where youth can learn new skills, interact with others, and develop into contributing adults. As a positive youth development organization, we have a moral and legal obligation to do so, and managing risk in our programs helps create that safe and healthy environment. In Minnesota 4-H, we have a risk management framework based on positive youth development, which builds on the personal responsibility of youth and volunteers while also addressing risk beyond their control. We want to pay attention to risk management because if we do, we can expect the following things to happen. First, our young people can focus on learning in a safe, comfortable environment. Second, we as volunteers and extension employees are prepared to deal with the many unexpected things that can happen to the participants, the spectators, the properties, and the reputation of 4-H. And finally, we again, volunteers and extension employees, limit our liability exposure as well as the liabilities of the organization. Safe programs don't just happen. They are designed, implemented, and evaluated in a way that youth safety is a priority and emphasized throughout the entire program. As we take a look now at some of the practices and tools, remember that we're committed to providing a common set of standards to inform your decision making, create safe learning environments, and provide you with the tools and trainings needed to ensure youth are kept safe. So let's move on to some of these tools so you can help keep youth safe in our programs. The risk management practices, policies, and tools are found on the Minnesota 4-H public website in the Volunteering with 4-H section. I'm going to go to the URL on the screen and take you to the risk management page on the Minnesota 4-H website. On the screen you will see the risk management website. All the tools you need for planning your programs are housed right here. Let's take a look at the three steps that are involved in preparing all programs. Step number one is the overall policies and practices. And it says, know and follow the overall risk management policies and practices information sheet when planning all 4-H programs. Use this when completing steps 2 and 3. Step 2 is program planning. Complete the risk management program planning tool before 4-H programs occur, utilizing the information from the overall risk management policies and practices information sheet, which is located above.
And step three is to utilize the individual information sheets to manage risk when planning programs, activities, and outings. Keep in mind that anything you see in red is a hot link and will take you right directly to that information. Steps one, two, and three are hot links as well as everything in red that's underlined. Let's take a look at step one, the overall policies and practices. This information applies to all of 4-H. Every program you plan, every event, every activity. When planning any program 4-H related, you will want to look at this information. You have two options here. You can click on the hot links to find the information, or you can go to the upper left-hand corner and click the print-friendly version. This is the overall risk management program policies and practices information sheet. It's a mirror image of the information that you see on the website, except for it's in hard copy. You want to make a copy of this to use for this presentation that we're having right now to work through the scenario. But it's also a good idea to have a copy of this document with you at all time when planning programs. So if you don't have access to the internet, you can still plan a safe and effective program. So let's take a look at the information that's housed right here on this website. This website, or the document that I just showed you, will answer most, if not all, of your questions around the following requirements while planning your programs. The first one is program requirements. They also include youth participation, volunteer participation, supervision, adult youth interactions, scheduling, emergency planning and procedures, activities and outings, facilities, room and sleeping arrangement, transportation, food safety and service, and U of M insurance. Let's walk through an example of how this works. So when you're planning a specific program and you want to know the youth requirements, you can quickly click on the hot link and find that. So I'll click on youth participation. Here it gives you all the information on what the youth needs to do to participate in any program. To return back, you hit return to table of contents and that will take you back to the beginning. So this document is step one, which is the overall policies and practices information. Now we're going to click on risk management expectation for volunteers and complete step number two. And now we're back to the risk management homepage and we're going to click on step two program planning. This is the program planning tool for volunteers that you will utilize with the resources we just talked about in step one, the overall policies and practices document and information. These questions will help you think about risk as you plan your 4-H programs, activities, and outings. In the upper left hand corner you will again find a print friendly version which is a PDF. You will want to print a copy of this document to use for today's scenario when we walk together through the scenario, but you'll want this along with a copy of the overall program policies and practices document. So even if you don't have internet access when planning a program, you still have all the information and tools you need when planning your programs and events concerning risk. As you plan your activities, be sure to answer questions 1 through 12. For example, the first question is, what are the requirements for youth participation? This is the same question that we answered when we looked at the overall program policies and practices document, or that website. When I click on the hot link, it takes me directly to the youth participation section of that document. And again, you'll want to read through the information on youth participation so you know the requirements for the program that you're planning. We'll hit return to table of contents and go back to return to risk management expectation for volunteers, which takes us to the home page. And now we can go to step three, information sheets. Step three contains information sheets that have details when planning specific programs. As you can see, the following information is listed here. Youth protection, which contains information on how to report child abuse and neglect if you should suspect that that's happening. Responding to specific emergency, like allergic reactions, lost and missing people and strangers, toxic plants, wild animals, bees and ticks, what to do in case there's a fire and chemical hazard, and also severe weather. When planning an animal program, we have animal education programs and exhibitions, transporting animals or equipment, and petting zoos. And then we have activities and outings, specific information on hay rides, organized biking, running, and walking events, parades, softball, water activities, and winter activities. 
and there's also project specific risk management and this deals with things that you can find on the Minnesota 4-H website such as clover buds, horse, and shooting sports. Now we're going to teach you how to use the risk management website when planning youth programs, but remember kids safety is in your hands and becoming familiar with and learning how to use this website from planning to managing to reporting is how we can help keep kids safe as they are involved in our 4-H programs. Your club has decided to host a new member recruitment night at the farm of a current 4-H family. The plan is to make birdhouses to showcase the woodworking project, host a hayride around the farm, and wrap up the night roasting hot dogs and singing 4-H songs around a campfire. The goal is to show potential members how much fun 4-H can be and encourage them to join your club. These are the documents that you will need in order to plan the program that follows the scenario that you read on the screen. First of all, you'll need a hard copy of step number one, the overall policies and practices document. You'll also need a hard copy of Step 2, the Program Planning Tool, and you'll also need a copy in Step 3, Information Sheets of the Hayrides. At this time, if you don't have these documents available, I'd like you to pause the video and go to the URL that's on the screen and take a moment to print these documents. So using the program planning tool, you want to make sure that you answer all the questions on the document by using the overall policies and practices information sheet as well as the Hayride information sheet. So question number one on the program planning tool is what are the requirements for youth participation in the program that you're planning? Now you'll look at the overall program policies and practices document to find that answer. You will continue this process to answer questions 1 through 12 on the program planning tool. Keep in mind that not every question may pertain to this event. And keep in mind you might not be able to find all your answers until you get to the very end of this document. When you get to question number 13, it will ask you if you need to look at any additional information sheets. And we know that it's important for you to look at the Hayride information sheet, which is on the right. Once you complete the entire program planning tool and answer all the questions, and only when it's completing can, completed can we determine if this is an activity that this club can host. Now I'm going to put a copy of the scenario back on the screen. Please pause the video, work through the entire program planning tool using the overall policies and practices document as well as the Hayride document. Once you have it complete, go ahead and hit play and we'll walk through and find the answers together. So how did your program planning go? And did you find all the answers to your questions? So what I'm going to do is click on Step 2 Program Planning and go through the interactive program planning tool. So again, your club has decided to host a new member recruitment night at the farm of a current 4-H family. So remember, this is a recruitment night. And you're going to make birdhouses to showcase the woodworking project. You're going to host a hayride around the farm. And you're going to wrap up the night roasting hot dogs and singing 4-H songs around a campfire. The goal is to show potential members how much fun 4-H can be and encourage them to join. So the first thing it asks are what are the requirements for youth participation in an event like this that we're hosting. So let's click on youth participation. So under youth participation it says youth including clover buds attending any 4-H program must be enrolled in 4-H except as noted. And so what are the exceptions so you don't have to be enrolled? The first one is a short-term low-risk marketing program where the parent or responsible adult are present and responsible for their children. And examples of that include an open house at school, a club at recruitment night or acceptable activity with the intent to recruit new members. And the second bullet is an organizational meeting where new youth and families gather to complete enrollment forms. Well, we know that this is not an event where they're going to gather and complete enrollment forms. And if I look at that bullet, I would need to find out, is this a low-risk marketing program? And I really don't know if hay rides and building birdhouses and having campfires is low-risk. So I'll have to keep working through the program planning tool. It also says where the parent or responsible adult are present and responsible for their children. And at this time, I don't know if parents will drop their children off and take off or if they'll stay for the event. Um, this is clearly not an open house and it is a club recruitment night, but I'm not sure if it's an acceptable activity. So we'll have to keep working through our plan. Number two, what are the requirements for volunteer participation? 
Any adult who volunteers with the Minnesota 4-H program must meet the following requirements. Adults who may spend unsupervised time with 4-H members or handle funds as part of Minnesota 4-H have to be accepted as Minnesota 4-H volunteers. This means they filled in an application, they have a criminal background check, and they do an online orientation. That orientation also includes the safety of minors. It's a required training. And Minnesota 4-H volunteers are required to promptly report any suspected child abuse or neglect of any minor. Down at the bottom, adults who are not accepted as Minnesota 4-H volunteers may only work with 4-H members when under the direct supervision of two or more Minnesota 4-H volunteers or extension employees. So Minnesota 4-H volunteers must not ask or allow parents, guardians, and community volunteers who have not gone through the required background screening, orientation, and safety of minors to serve in a role where they will have unsupervised contact with minors other than their own child or that otherwise requires the status as a Minnesota 4-H volunteer. Number three, what are the supervision requirements? When minors attend programs without a parent or guardian, Minnesota 4-H volunteers and extension employees are expected to provide adequate supervision. There has to be a minimum of two Minnesota 4-H volunteers and or extension employees present at all times. These individuals are included in the following ratios. So the number of youth to adult supervision changes depending on the age of the youth. These ratios must be met at all times, and Minnesota 4-H volunteers are responsible for program organization, and they're available in case of an emergency. Number four, what are the guidelines for adult and youth interactions? Here's just friendly reminders that both in-group and home settings, Minnesota 4-H volunteers are expected to interact with youth in the following manner. They have to follow the requirements of the Minnesota 4-H Volunteer Code of Conduct and the Parent Guardian Code of Conduct. So it's important to click into that and understand the Code of Conduct that was signed. Again, to promptly re re report any abuse or neglect. Never be alone with just one child unless it's your own child. Make sure you respect the privacy of all members and volunteers when it comes to toilets, clothes being changed, and showers. Ensure check-in and check-out processes in place for participants when they leave a program um, that you know how they're getting picked up. And monitor 4-H members. Make sure that two Minnesota 4-H volunteers are, must stay in the general area with 4-H members throughout the entire 4-H educational program, activity, or event, and remain on site until all 4-H members have left. Uh, the key here is that it has to be two adults and never one adult alone with the child. It can be one adult with two youth or two adults with one youth, but never one-on-one. -on -one. And to make sure that there's, uh, they conduct a head count on a regular basis during the 4-H educational program to make sure that youth are all accounted for. Number five is scheduling. Scheduling is important if an accident or an incident occurs because the 4-H program coordinator needs to know that the, the event happened. A 4-H program must be publicly scheduled and an extension employee must be notified. All 4-H programs are considered publicly scheduled when the extension employee is notified and they're listed on a University of Minnesota County webpage, Facebook, a county calendar, or in the club plan of work or the club charter. And if there's a schedule change, it could happen due to weather. Uh, make sure that the extension employee is notified and a schedule change should also be included in the 4-H club meeting minutes. Number six, what are the medical and emergency procedures that need to take place? This is great to click into just so you remember the things that you should have on hand, just in case. It's really important to have health forms for the kids, that you have numbers of contacts just in case they get hurt, who do you call? As you go down, there's an emergency contact card, so you have the number of the 4-H program coordinator. In case there's an accident, you can call them. Is there a first aid kit and should you have one on hand? So this area just gives you information on what you should have on hand in case there is an incident or an accident. What are the requirements or limitations for the 4-H outings and activities that are planned? When making decisions about program activities, it's important to be aware that there are number one, acceptable activities, number two, activities acceptable when part of a 4-H project, Number three, activities that are not allowed. And number four, activities only allowed if conducted by another entity. Under acceptable activities, it says the following activities are acceptable to be conducted by a 4-H group for 4-H members. 
It doesn't say anything about non-members here. It also says discuss these activities with the 4-H program coordinator to assess the risk to determine suitable safety training and ensure controls are in place to reduce or eliminate the potential for injuries, risks, and hazards. So I see campfires is listed and hayrides is also listed and those are two of the activities this club wants to do. But where the conflicting information comes in, it says that it can be conducted for 4-H members and nothing about new members. So we'll have to continue to work through this form to see if we can host the activity that this club wants to host. Number eight, what are the requirements for use of facilities? If utilizing the residential property of a Minnesota 4-H volunteer or 4-H family, ensure the homeowners are aware that they are assuming some risk by hosting the 4-H program activity on their personal property. So when organizing a program, make sure the family knows that if it's on their personal profit property that they are assuming some of the risk. And property owners are required to take reasonable care to protect those attending from any known hazards on the property. A property owner may be liable for an injury if he or she knew or should have known of a potentially dangerous condition on the property that could result in unreasonable risk or bodily harm. And so it's important that if a homeowner is hosting a 4-H program on their farm or on their residence that they look around and make sure that everything is safe and there's no hazards. If an overnight event, what are the requirements for room and sleeping arrangements? And we don't have this, but I will click on it so you can see the information, that it tells you all the information and all the rulings behind room and sleeping arrangements. Number 10, what are the transportation requirements? Transportation to and from 4-H programs, activities, outings, and events is the responsibility of the family. And since these kids are getting rides to the, to the farm, to where the hayride is, um, the University of Minnesota has no oversight or responsibility for family organized transportation, including carpooling arrangement, and it relies on the driver's compliance with federal, state, and local laws. And the liability and accident insurance follows the owner of the vehicle. If Minnesota 4-H were organizing the event, like chartering a bus or setting up carpooling arrangements, then there are rules that need to be followed. What are the requirements for serving or selling food? Let's click on that. Here's a whole bunch of information about serving and selling food. And you can see where it says serving food or hosting a potluck at a 4-H program. You need to follow the guidelines above and review the Minnesota Statute 157.22 for potluck guidelines. And there you can find more information. Just want to make sure you're safe throughout your programs. What insurance coverage is needed? It's important for you to know that County 4-H programs purchase annual accident insurance for all 4-H members and Minnesota 4-H volunteers, but some high-risk activities require special insurance, such as snow tubing and downhill skiing. And if you should participate in a program like that, you should contact the local program coordinator for information. When programs are appropriately scheduled, which we've talked about scheduling, and appropriately supervised, which we've talked about that, then the University of Minnesota General Liability Insurance provides coverage for bodily injury or property, property damage. Um, the University of Minnesota Professional Liability Insurance provides coverage for Minnesota volunteers for legal liability when they're acting within the scope of their role on behalf of Minnesota 4-H. And remember that automobile insurance always follows the owner of the vehicle. In addition to the general program policies and practices listed above, it says use the following topic specific information sheets when planning 4-H programs and activities. And we know that we want to click on Hayride. Hayrides are a fun team building activity that 4-H members may otherwise not experience, but due to the potential for injury, safety practices are essential. That first line tells me that this is for 4-H members and that there is potential for injury, and that makes this a high risk activity for 4-H members. That also tells me that if I'm doing a new member night, that this probably is not a good idea. However, if I'm having a hayride for my 4-H club for the enrolled members, this is a great document to give me additional information on how to make sure that all the participants are kept safe. So again with this scenario, after working through the program planning tool, is this an acceptable activity for you to be doing for a new member night? 
because it says the club has decided to host a new member recruitment night at the farm of a current 4-H family. So we know if it's at a farm of a 4-H family that the family assumes some of the risk and some of the responsibility. The plan is to make birdhouses to showcase the woodworking project. And honestly, we don't know about the birdhouses, so this is probably a question that we'll have to ask our 4-H program coordinator. It's also important for us to know how are they making the birdhouses? Are they using power tools? Are they using a hammer and nail? Are they using pop cans and glue? That would make a huge difference to determine if this was high risk or low risk. And because it's new member, it would have to be very low risk. Hosting a hayride around the farm is something that's not acceptable for a new member night. A hayride is acceptable for 4-H members, but would not be a good idea for a night such as this. Roasting hot dogs is fine, singing 4-H songs is great, and doing it around a campfire, but also going through all the rules of the campfire as far as having water nearby and how close you can be to the campfire would be really important for youth safety. So the synopsis is they could do some of these things, but they could, but not all of these things. And there might be better ideas for a new recruitment night. A final tool that we want to share with you today is this volunteer emergency contact card. This card is designed to fit in your purse, wallet, or back pocket for you to have at your program location. It provides contact information for staff as well as emergency procedures. On this card, you'll want to know the number of your 4-H program coordinator, the Extension Educator for Operations, as well as the 4-H Program Coordinator Supervisor. You'll want to contact your Extension Office to get this information. Wow, we've gone through a lot of information today. The question is, how can you share this information with other volunteers? The more volunteers we have trained, the safer our 4-H programs and youth will be who participate in them. You could share this with your club, at a Federation Council meeting, share with your local PD. PDCs, talk about it when you're at 4-H events, but please help us get the word out and suggest this training to other volunteers. And one final thought before we end, risk management is everyone's responsibility, not just the people watching this video, not just the staff. Your charge is to take it back to your club or program, and our charge is to answer your questions, keep you informed of new tools and updates, and partner with you to keep youth safe and the 4-H program protected. Please complete the short evaluation which can be found on the website below this video and thank you for all you do in developing young people.